Hello everybody. My name is Alan Connor and I'm at Cherry Red TV today. And today our guest is the lovely Teresa Bazaar. Hello Alan, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm fabulous, thank you. Very happy person today. So, uh, the primary reason we're here today is because we're at the 40th anniversary of the first dollar hits. Mm -hmm. So, shooting star, who are you in the moonlight? Love's got a hold of me, I want to hold your hand. And Cherry Red have uh, very lovingly put together a nice selection of goodies, dollar goodies. Yeah. The Ultimate Dollar Box, which is six CDs and a DVD of all the videos. A Greatest Hits two CD set. And a really stunning gold vinyl Shooting Stars LP, which was Dollar's first Top 40 album back in 1979. Yeah, golden record, it's so nice. So we'll get on to, to Dollar a bit further on, but probably what would be nice is if you give us a bit of background about how you got to that point. So you were born in Canada. Yep. Uh, and then when you were about six months old, you moved to Cheltenham. That's right. Country girl. Uh, country girl. And so maybe you can just tell us a bit about growing up in Cheltenham, why, what you wanted to be as a young girl and how, I think, maybe how you got to Guys and Dolls. Yes. Um, back in, like, very, very early days. So I think the bug to perform or be a creative uh, hit me when I was about two and a half. And uh, my sister went to dancing class and uh, a ballet class and I wouldn't leave, I refused to leave. And so the, 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 the very lovely ballet teacher said to my mum, well, if she stands up the back and she doesn't make a sound, she can stay. And of course I stood up the back two and a half copying everything and that was it. I went every week from the age of two and a half. Dancing became my life. Um, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Loved classical music, Chopin, Tchaikovsky. But um, I think I got to about 12 years old and thought, I'm not sure it's going to work for me. I'm not quite the right body shape. I'm a little bit too small. Probably they're not the right shape and I maybe wasn't good enough. So I thought, well, if I can't do that, I'll sing and dance. I'll sing and dance. Um, and so my dad bought me a banjo instead of a guitar. So I said, I need a guitar, I want to learn to play an instrument. And because I, he thought I was, my hands were so small that he'd buy me a banjo and tune the last four strings to the, to the last four strings of the, a guitar, which he did. And um, he forgot that they're metal strings, so my fingers were almost bleeding, but didn't stop me. And I learned the first chords, I think in about two hours, and was writing my first song later that day. So I sort of, became immersed in songwriting and creating my own lyrics, of course, as well. And um, then I decided to go to professional stage school, which I did, performing arts school. And my first job, I mean, because that's it, you have to get a job. And to get a job, you have to be in the union. You have to have an equity card. And you can't get a job unless you've got an equity card. And you can't get an equity card until you've got a job. So very chicken and egg. It is, yes. Very hard. So at my performing arts school, there was an advert for a pantomime, Snow White. They're looking for dwarfs, non-speaking roles in a costume, so no one really sees you. But um, you, there are two equity cards up for grabs. And I thought, well, I'm very small. I'll go and audition for a dwarf. So I went along and I did my song and my dance uh, and, uh, and a piece of um, prose uh, speech. And uh, I think it started at 10. I was still there at five o'clock, sitting in this drafty corridor. I was the only one left. It's getting darker and darker. And I'm thinking, what a hard life this is going to be for a non-speaking part. And they got me back in and they said, would you mind just doing your song and your dance again? And I said, yes, that's fine. And I did it. And then they called me over to the table. And they said, well, thank you for staying so long, but we haven't cast the part of Snow White yet. And would you like to be Snow White? And I went, yes, please. And uh, so that was the first job. And um, which was pretty grueling, seven, seven songs in, in, in a pantomime, you know, it was a lot to remember. I was very young, I was about 17. And then uh, I was out of work and I saw an ad in the stage newspaper. I remember the day, adverts in newspapers. The old print before the internet. Oh, it's so lovely. Yes. And uh, it was for girls and boys who could sing and dance. And I thought, oh, you know, singing, dancing, that's me. So I went along to this audition and uh, I'd really, got a great handle on what was going on. I wore a black polo neck jumper and a sort of a boring A-line below the knee black skirt, some flat boots and a raincoat. That's what I went to the audition looking like. And I sang somewhere from West Side Story and my speech was um, Puck, 
Shakespeare from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Edgy. Oh, no <laughs> idea. I was the most conservative, naive person. And, um, and after the I audition, they said, well, where do you live? I said, I live at home with mum and dad. And they said, well, how would they feel if you're traveling around the country and you're away from home and you're performing? I said, oh, I think they'd be okay if I phoned mum every night and told her where I was. And I think they thought, this is putty in our hands. She's so naive. So it's either that, or maybe I was the only girl shorter than David Van Dyke. <laughs> so I'm not sure, I'd, or maybe I was just had, a, had potential. So I don't know. But anyway, got chosen, and that was for Guys and Dolls. And Guys and Dolls met for the first time on the 8th of November, 1974. That's right. And ironically, you had a, quite a special reunion recently on the same day, didn't you? Yes. So uh, managed to keep in touch with the dolls, well, all of everyone, actually, but particularly the dolls, Martine, Howard, and Judy Forsyth. And uh, when I knew that um, finally that the dollar, dollar compendium of the ultimate box set and of greatest hits and a vinyl was all going to come out to celebrate 40 years of dollar the 40th anniversary I sort of started thinking should I maybe think about putting on a show like a one-woman show up close and personal and uh, part of my idea was if that was going to happen that Julie and Martine would come and sing with me which would be such a lovely reunion it's all about celebration and um, and they said yes so uh, we decided to meet for a couple of rehearsals and the night before Julie sent a WhatsApp to Martine and myself and said, do you know what tomorrow is? And we both went, no. She said, it's the 8th of November. She said, that's 45 years ago to the day that we both, we all met, which I thought was, um, ooh, sort of tingly, was, tingly feeling. Fantastic, yeah. And back on the 8th of November, 1974, you all met for the first time. And then two or three months later, the first single came out, which was mm. There's a Whole Lot of Loving. Um, what are your memories about that particular time and about the song? Oh, I, I, I really liked it. I mean, I, when I joined Guys and Dolls, what I didn't say at the audition, which was probably the correct thing to do, was I didn't really like pop music. I mean, I didn't really listen to pop music. I didn't really know much about it. I liked the Carpenters. I loved the Carpenters. And I practiced all the harmonies so I could harmonize and I understood. But I didn't really like pop. And so, of course, I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to tell anyone. I don't really know much about pop. And I uh, heard this record and I thought, it sounds great. I loved the harmonies. It sounded so charming. And, you know, middle of the road, M.O.R., which is exactly where we were placed, you know, uh, in, in the, the music industry. Uh, I thought it was perfect. It, it was a lovely wholesome, a wholesome kind of sound. Yeah. And it made number two in the charts. So your first record was a huge hit. It was. Um, that was featured on the Guys and Dolls self-titled album. Yeah. Um, and then you did a lot of touring with Guys and Dolls and there were a couple of other hits. Mm. And how, do you remember how the idea to do You Don't Have to Say You Love Me came about? Uh, not really. You might know about that. I don't. I, I think, I think, once I begin, began to realise I love pop music and I was really interested in the music side, I was interested obviously in the performance side and the image and all of that, but I was really interested in the music. And I think we were all so busy and we'd had such an enormous success so quickly. I think it took everyone, our management, everyone by surprise. And so we were always scratching around for really good songs. And I think it was almost, if we can't find a really good song, better to do a cover version mm -hmm. of a very, very strong hit. So, which is why we did You Are My World as well. Familiarity that people loved the song and they were very happy to hear Guys and Dolls do a different treatment of it. Yeah. Because it was hard to find really big, strong, contemporary sounding songs. Yeah, and You Are My World, of course, was number one in Holland. Mm. Where Guys and Dolls had a huge following. Yes. And probably continue to do so as well. Yeah, Holland. Twice a week, I think, we used to go and do television and radios, yeah. So, out of all the Guys and Dolls songs, which would you say was your favourite? Oh. Um, I think you don't have to say you love me, because my harmony was great, so I really... <laughs> and I think it, it just... We sounded so good. You know, it was, we could sing it anywhere, a cappella. Um, you know, it always, it just always seemed to just hit the right spot. So, yeah. Now, so Guys and Dolls was 
75, 76, kind of into 77. Mm. And I think it's fair to say that you were probably becoming quite disillusioned with the direction that the group was going. I was. So can you tell us a bit about the decision or the background as to as to how you and, and also David Van Day um, ended up departing Guys and Dolls? Yeah, we got kicked out. We got kicked out. So the story goes, so there are two stories, and, and speaking to Julie and Martin about it, their understanding of what happened was very, very different to what actually happened. So they were told half-truths, I suppose you might say. Um, so David Van Day was very disillusioned because he wanted to, be, to have more of a lion's share of, of, of the, the singles and a, little, a chance to at least sing lead vocal therefore you get more camera shots on TV. So it's a bit of an ego thing. But also I think the idea originally for Guys and Dolls was that everybody would get a chance to do lead vocals. It was meant to be spread across. But I think what happened was that a formula had been created with Dominic and Martin singing the lead vocals. And when you're having success, it takes a lot of courage to break that mold. So we did on the album um, tracks, but not on the, the singles. singles. So. Um, David was getting pretty um, disgruntled about all of that. So he was planning to leave. He wanted to leave, he wanted to try and get a solo deal and become a solo artist. David Jones, uh, David um, Cassidy and Donny Osmond all rolled into one. And I thought, if that's what you want to do, great. But I was, even though I was disillusioned by the choice of material and the direction we were going, and I kept saying, I, I, mean, I did raise my voice and say, I think we should be spending more time in the studio trying to create fantastic records rather than going round and around the UK performing six nights out of seven and doing television and doing photo shoots and radio interviews all the time, constantly. So one morning, uh, I think we just got back to London and our manager at the time said, uh, there's a meeting for everyone at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I sort of remember thinking, gosh, it's a bit early because we've just got back really quite late the night before, but anyway, up David and I got, because your girlfriend and boyfriend living together, we go along to the office and there's nobody else there except the manager. And uh, I sort of was looking around, I said, well, where is everyone? He said, oh, I actually just wanted to have a chat to the both of you. And he said, I've um, been speaking to the others and clearly you're both very disillusioned with how everything's going, so we think it's probably best that um, you leave and follow your own career as you want to. So we got chucked out, basically, which um, I was heartbroken. I was absolutely heart David didn't mind at all, because he was planning to go. He back. wanted to go anyway. Yeah. yeah, but I was heartbroken, because the plan was I was meant to stay and earn some money to support us, whilst he went and tried to seek a solo deal. So, um, so that's what happened. And um, Judy was actually living with David and myself at the time, and I remember going home and chucking her clothes down the stairs. I was so upset. I didn't know what to do. I, I, it was scary because you suddenly have this world, and then suddenly it's just been taken away from you. But um, the dolls have a very different story, and they said they were told that David and I had just said we wanted to go. Right. And that we wanted to go, and that's what they were told. So they never knew that we'd been fired. And it was probably quite difficult to clear that up because once you've left, that's it, you're probably divorced from them. You, you had no contact with them for, for quite a while, I think. I think there was probably a period in the early 80s where maybe there was a little bit of contact, but after that, there was probably nothing for a long time. I mean, I was gutted and I felt I, felt I was betrayed by the others in the group. I felt we were all really close friends. How could they do that? If, you know, if you've got a problem, have a conversation. Yeah. But, but it was just so underhand so cutthroat it was um i was really devastated but as it turned out it mm -hmm. probably worked out for the best it was, because yes. um although it took a little bit of time there's no doubt that what you went on to was was, was certainly for yourself and, and for david bigger and better um so you left guys and dolls mm -hmm. you didn't want a solo deal you were offered a solo I deal was a solo deal by a dutch record company I didn't even think about it for more than 30 seconds. I just went, no, 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 thanks very much, but you've got it wrong. He's the one that wants a record deal, the solo deal. I was happy to stay put in guys and also, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but it's him, not me. And they went, okay. 
and David couldn't get a deal. She just just couldn't get a solo record deal. Because I think at the time you were pretending to be the secretary, weren't you, to yeah. arrange meetings with labels to, for, mm -hmm. for David's career. And, and then eventually, you'd, you'd been songwriting anyway together because you'd written at least one song in Guys and Dolls, mm. the B-side of you know, My World you mm. wrote. Um, and there was one other that didn't come out. Um, and you, you'd kept writing together anyway. So you'd stockpiled quite a lot of material um, probably some of the stuff that you would end up later recording. You'd done some demos, mm -hmm. um, predominantly with David as a lead vocalist, because that's what you were, you were promoting. You were promoting David Absolutely. as a lead singer. Yeah. So you were adding the, 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 the yeah. wall of I sound. I was doing like Carpenter's esque yeah. sort of wall of sound, fluffy bits yeah. in the background. Yeah. So with that in mind, that you were developing your craft as a songwriter, you were pushing David for a solo career. You then ended up going a completely different direction. How did you end up um, signing with Acrobat? Uh, we, um, somehow, somebody introduced us to a Radio 1 promotion guy and um, who just met a chap that they decided to form a management company together. And this chap actually, again, very forward thinking, he had a video shop. I mean, no one had video shops then, but he opened a video shop in Rains Park suburb of London, I remember that. And um, he didn't know anything about the music business really, but he was quite savvy in business. And this other guy wasn't very good in business, but he, was, he knew everyone in the music business. So um, they, they were speaking and said, well, we could manage you if you like. And I said, well, that would be great because we're not getting anywhere here. And, and this chap dares, he said, look, I've heard that there's a new record company forming with a very, very respected um, managing director and um, I'm going to go and have a chat, but I've got an idea. How, how about that I present you as a girl-boy duo? Because there isn't a girl-boy duo in the UK, and maybe that would be a good something, you know, fill that niche. And uh, so he went along, and he spoke to Chris Yule, who just started Acrobat Records, and he showed them a couple of photographs of us, and um, Chris just went, I'll sign them. He didn't even hear us Didn't sing. play the tape. No, nope, he remember didn't him, play he, the tape. No. He said to me, that you were quite taken aback by the fact that you were getting a record deal without actually having to play the no. tape that you you put all this effort into. No. So isn't that interesting? You see, again, so uh, I, I suppose perceptive about how things were going to develop that it was image, yeah, a girl boy image that you know. And I guess he assumed that we could sing because we were in Guys and Dolls and it had hits. So I think he probably thought they're not tone deaf, um, but he just. Saw, saw the potential, it's fascinating. And I think uh, he also had a, a great stable of writers and record producers already signed up to work for the label for the various artists he was signing. Yeah. And, um, and, we, and he had a couple of David Courtney songs and he had Chris Neal, um, stunning producer, um, who I thought was so experienced and so sort of professional. And he was like a very young guy who hadn't had that much experience anyway, but again, all this talent, and um, then he could just see how to put sort of like a, a package together. Yeah, mm. because Chris Neal had had a couple of hits, hadn't he? Done Paul Nicholas yes. and uh, Marshall Hayne. Yes. Um, of course, David Courtney had written a lot of the early Leo Sayer yeah, hits. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so Chris then decided to give you a couple of songs that he'd been kind of squirreling away for the right act. Yeah. Um, that David Courtney had written mm. and paired you with his hot producer of the time. Yeah. So that's where Shooting Star yeah. came from. And it wasn't, and I think the other thing that was so interesting is it would have been so easy to make us very cheesy, you know, very, very M.O.R., Donnie and Marie type of act, but he wanted something a little bit more sophisticated, musically anyway, and, and, and yet we, and we would front this sort of classy production sound that was very, again, it was very new using synthesizers and it was a different sound, light years away from Guys and Dolls. There was nothing else really in the charts. No, nothing. I like mean, that. And it, although it only made number 14, it actually sold over 250,000 copies, which, mm. you know, at the time was I know, I've still got my silver disc yeah. for that, yeah. Do you remember the recording of the record and what was going through your mind at the time? I love the synthesizer sounds. It was like, it was just so interesting because no one had really used the whooshing sounds and all those doo -doo, doo -doo, all those little sounds, star, you know, those sort of Star Wars sounds. I suppose um, 
the carpenters had used a little bit of that on interplanetary craft and that kind of sound. Uh, but it was, it was different. And Chris was so, um, had a very subtle approach to his production skills. You know, less is more, lots of gaps, lots of space and air around the sounds and everything was allowed to breathe. So it was, it was tight in some areas, but still kind of had a groove about it. It was a really interesting sort of like vibe, I think, to those records. Still love them, they still sound great today. They do, and mm -hmm. Who Are You In The Moonlight came quickly after, which is another David Courtney song, yep, yep. Um, with some fabulous backing vocals from Harsh, Sharp and Piercing. Oh, yes. And do you, what do you remember about those guys? Oh, the guys, I, I, I used to laugh and laugh for once I was able to sit back in one of the chairs in the studio and watch Chris Neal and Frank Musker and Dominic Bugatti, who call themselves Harsh, Sharp and Piercing, doing these backup vocals, they are harmonies, oh, it was magic. And they, they laughed, they just laughed all the time. They had such fun and it was, the sounds they made were great. So you can, you can hear them all across a lot of the dollar, um, the Shooting Stars album, which is a, a treat. It is. Mm. So the first two hits were songs provided to you. Mm -hmm. So you were, while you were working on those singles, you were recording an album as well, because yep. you were in the, you, the, a lot of it was done in 1978, even though it came out in 1979. Yeah, it was a rush, yeah. It was a it rush. Was a rush yeah. So there were a few more kind of brought in tracks, Ring mm. Ring, Love Street, mm. but pretty much the rest of it, you and David wrote yourselves. And probably the, the, the standout on the album is, is Love's Got a Hold On Me, um, which of course made number four, another, another quarter of a million seller, probably closer to 400,000. Mm. Um, 400,000 no. copies, isn't that extraordinary? It is. Yeah. Now, that was your lead, so that was, that was your song. Tell us a bit about the song and the making of it and what you remember. <laughs> uh, so, I remember writing that actually um, on the piano. We had a piano in our flat and uh, I loved the Bee Gees. Again, sort of loved that, that sort of the blocks of harmonies and, and the air that they created and their sort of the, 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 the style of the harmonies and the, and the melodies. So I thought, I wanted, How Deep Is Your Love was the inspiration. I thought right. I'd love to write something soft and floaty and summery and gentle. And uh, so I started coming out with the melody for Love's Got a Hold of Me and uh, made a little demo. And, uh, and the guys at the label went, yeah, 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 that's definitely um, on the album. So Chris was laying down all the tracks, obviously in those days, real musicians in the studio, you know, no drum machines yet, it was just real musicians. And uh, we went in to start laying the vocals down to Love's Got a Hold of Me. And Davey went into the studio and he just couldn't sing it. It just didn't sound right. And Chris was looking at me and I was looking at him going, I, I don't really understand. And Chris said, but you wrote this, didn't you? And I said, well, yeah, I, I, I wrote it basically. David sort of was there, but it wasn't really much to do with him. But it's definitely in his key. You know, that's how it was demoed. And he said, well, it's not happening is it? I said no it's not. He said go and have a go and I looked and I said but Chris it's not in my key it's David's key. I said it's going to be very high. He said just go and have a go and I was such a good girl I mean whatever anyone asked me to do I'd go I'll have a go and so I went in and I started singing it was so high and my voice is very... The rafters. <laughs> yeah and, it's a, and I, I've got a very small light voice there's a little signal as a frequency but a lot of air around it. So um, I started singing it and I saw this smile on Chris's face and he sort of goes like thumbs up. And I said, really? As I, start, I said, really? He said, really, really. He said, let's do the chorus first and let's start blocking up your harmonies, which was actually the very first dollar record that we started to have that approach where I would just layer up my vocal sound as the harmonies. So just to explain to people who may not be familiar with the term blocking, what it actually means. So I would sing, so we would work out what my harmonies would be um, above the melody or below the melody. And then I would say, well, look, and the producer normally says, would you want to start from the top going downwards or the bottom below the melody? So I choose, for example, to sing the, the closest harmony above the melody, the tune, and I sing the harmony line. And then I'd end up wanting to sing, repeat the same line probably eight times record it eight times, so it'd be eight of me doing something identical. So you've got to be pretty accurate 
in copying, emulating exactly what you've done with the breath where you come in, the endings of the words. And, um, and then when we did eight of them, then we do the next harmony with another eight of me. And then sometimes he'd say, could we do another four? So it's 12, because I just want it to be a thicker sound. And um, so sometimes you'd have sort of 64 of me, all singing. All singing at once. All singing at once, yeah. And then once you've got that, then my lead vocal, which as I said, is a, I've got a small voice, but it would just sit in front of all this sort of wall of sound of me behind, which is a completely different texture yeah. to the sound of a single voice at the front. And we sort of created Teresa's sound, really. Yeah. Mm. And it was a stunning record. It was a lovely record. It was, it was also a very hot summer. I remember it was such a sunny, hot summer. And it was on the radio all the time. It was just like, yeah, it was just, just happened to click. And you've been promoting in France, I believe. Must have been Who We With The Moonlight, you were mm, over there singing. Mm. And then you'd just come back, didn't you? And you'd gone to the telephone box to see where you were in the charts. Do you yeah. remember that? Yeah, we, we, we flew in. It was quite... Um, the charts came out at about 10 o'clock, I think, on a Tuesday morning. And we got an early flight from Paris, arriving at the airport. And um, um, it was about quarter past 10. You know, and we were running to find a phone, a phone that was vacant that we could use to phone. I mean, back in the day, phone the record company. And I, it had done some enormous jump. I think it had jumped right from outside the top 40 straight into the top 20, I think. Is that right? It's about 23, I think. 23. I think of about 55 to 23. So, so we were in the a top huge 30 jump, and, you know, that, yeah. and, and the, that guaranteed that we were on top of the pops. And uh, so excited. Oh, my goodness. It was such a shock. Had no idea that it was doing so well because... You know, you couldn't follow things in those days. And if we we're promoting one record in another country, I mean, you're not going to phone the record company or ask the people with you to say, can you find out how that's doing? You just sort of head down and focus on what you're working on there. Just to divert slightly while we're talking about Top of the Pops, what was it like performing on that show? Um, scary. I was pretty scared most of the time. It was so pressurised. I mean, you've got your three minutes to either nail it and really, really do a great performance or it just doesn't work for some reason. I don't know. It's not even sometimes just your performance. I mean, by the time you get there, you've chosen what you're going to wear, how you're going to do your hair, how you've staged it. And, and you never really know how you're going to be set, you know, how, how the producers of the show see it. So it's, um, it's always, I was always scared. And a bit bored because it's a long, a long, long day. days how, waiting around. How do you keep yourself yeah. occupied in a dressing room when there's nothing to do? Sing a bit, practice a bit, sit down, have a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Not like today. Be on your phone. We'll come back to the outfits a bit later because I think it's, it's fair to say as, as the 80s went on, things got a bit more interesting on the oh, old yes. outfit front. Yeah. But just staying with the timeline. So Love's Got to Hold Me, a big hit. The album mm. Shoot with Stars came out, went to the top 40. But then you did a cover version, so do you remember what the rationale was? Because it wasn't even on the Shooting Stars album. I want so, to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. So yeah. what happened with that song? How did that come about? Um, that was Chris Neal's idea. I think we, I think Love's Got a Hold of Me was such an enormous hit. Took everyone by surprise and again was on the chart for I don't know how many weeks, but months, I think about four months, yeah. something like that. So how do, you, how do you follow up that kind of record? And it's a ballad, you know, so it's, you don't want another ballad. You, you need something strong. And there was nothing that we had, you know, recorded that really was a guaranteed crowd pleaser, a hit. Uh, and I think Chris came in and said, let's do a cover version. And then and he came up with the idea of doing I Want to Hold Your Hand in yeah. this completely different treatment. And I didn't realise the enormity of that decision at the time. I mean, to do a Beatles cover. Dollar, you know, we we weren't so loved by the music press. You know, we were too squeaky clean, or we were too cheesy, or we were, I don't know, too uh, bubble gummy, whatever. So to do that it was it was quite risky, but um, paid off. It was it was a great great approach, I thought. And that's when the blonde hair arrived, wasn't it? Yeah, and very Mary Quant, very sixties, which is all back now, of course. But uh, black and white dress in you know checkered style, and yeah. uh, and I remember making the video for that. And I uh, had this makeup lady. Um, she was quite an elderly makeup lady. And she said, how do you want your makeup? I said, I don't really know, just normal, I suppose. And um, she said, well, we better do something to fit your outfit. And she started doing this 
really 60s sort of Kathy McGowan kind of very dark sort of eyeliner. And, um, and I was watching her do it and my heart was going like that, going, was going, um, oh my goodness, you know, what is she doing? What is that going to look like on camera? More makeup than I'd ever, ever worn before. And then they did a couple of test shots and I looked at it, it looked fantastic. And I was, you know, so very, very grateful that you have to sometimes let the professionals do, do their, their thing. Job. Yeah. yeah, do their yeah. job. So um, I thought that video was fantastic. It was a great yeah. look. And um, you stayed with the blonde hair then, but you yes. changed record labels. Yep. So after I Want to Hold Your Hand um, made the top 10, you could really a very strong position. I think I had four big hits mm. um, within a year, essentially. Uh, and you moved to Warner Brothers. So uh, We did, we did. And we left Chris behind, which was very sad. Um, yeah, we moved on. And I think um, that's always the thing, isn't it? How do you keep your momentum going, but don't get predictable or boring musically? Very, very hard. You know, yeah. so, we had, so I think you know, we'd had so much success. We wanted to do something a little bit different. Couldn't quite get the right package together with the right producer. Um, so in the end, we um, produced some, the, rec uh, uh, the Paris collection ourselves and, and wrote the album ourselves, which I think was maybe striving for credibility, saying, we can do this, we can do this, watch us. And some of the, some of the singles got close, mm. but uh, a bit adventurous, I would say, with maturity in hindsight. Bit adventurous. It was an interesting album because you changed. I always describe the early dollar records as very soft focus sound. Mm. Whereas with the Paris collection, you just went completely the opposite direction for half of it, at least. Mm. It was very rocky. I mean, it did. It really suited David's voice, to be fair. Rock, that rocky, edgy mm. sound. You could tell that probably that's the kind of music that he maybe liked to listen to, mm. with a bit of oomph. Yes. Um, and he really did a great job on those vocals. Um, and it was quite fitting and refreshing for the kind of coming into 1980. But I guess it just, you just needed that one song that hooked the imagination of the public and just didn't quite click with that album. It, as I said, I think it, it was just too much of a shift. I mean, if we'd have been, it, it should have been a, a more gentle, a, a more of a transition. But I think, um, so the music scene was changing so dramatically. If we'd have kept doing what we were doing, I'm not so sure that would have been the right decision either. So we didn't really know what to do. Yeah. Simple as that, but we tried. And it wasn't a success, but we gave it a shot. Critically, it was probably the best received album. Well, there you go. So that's the thing. You shouldn't really listen to the press because yeah. the press would probably have some influence in us trying to deliver what would be better received. Whereas we perhaps should have stuck to what tried and tested formula. It's always difficult, isn't it, to know how to... How to well, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? it? Is, you know, it it's is. very easy to say that 40 years ago, we should have done this, we yeah. should have done that. But you, you're doing the best that you can No, definitely, time. definitely. But um, out of something not so good, something great happens, so... Uh, Which is kind of dollar mark too, really, I, yes. I tend to think of it as. So, Paris Collection, interesting uh, batch of songs mm. in the ultimate dollar box with some, some nice extras in there. Then you kind of took off to Pop's Premier League, really, with the next decision. <laughs> uh, what happened next? Oh, you see, it's just, it's all about mo just like moments in time. So I was driving around, always listening to the radio, flipping stations, and, um, and I heard this sort of, ooh, -ah, ooh, -ah. and I sort of was driving, like, what's that? And I heard it again, ooh, -ah. and I thought, wow. And then, poof, poof, the bass drum, so I pulled my car over, and I listened to a video called The Radio Star. And I was just, my jaw, I went, that is the best record I have heard in such a long time. I just fell in love with it immediately and I, and I just was absolutely committed. I said, whoever's made that, that's who we need. It was the clarity yeah. of sound. It was bouncing out of the radio at you. you know, it was grabbing you in. It was so good. So it um, can be quite persuasive as you may or may not know. Oh, I know that. <laughs> you know that. And uh, so I found Trevor's number. I can't remember how I did it, but it was much easier back then. And I called him, and he actually answered the phone, and I explained who I was, and he said, yeah, I'm familiar with your records. And, um, and I said, look, I've heard Video Killed the Radio Star, and it's fantastic. Please, please, would you consider working with us? And he just went, 
no, 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 love, you know, I, made, I wrote that and made it, but um, I'm not a record producer. I said, yeah, 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 but if you could just maybe think about it or talk to us. Anyway, I persuaded him to meet us for, for lunch and um, we met him. And he wasn't really, really taken with the idea. But then we were talking, he was asking us what, we, what was in the pipeline and what we were doing. And, uh, I, and, I, and I mentioned, I said, oh, we're actually going to Tokyo soon. We're actually in the Tokyo Yamaha Song Festival. And suddenly this little light bulb went off in his head, like his eyes started sparking. He went, really? Because, I mean, you know, going to Tokyo back in 1980 was quite a big, mm. it was a big deal. It was. And um, by the end of lunch, he said, well, I can't promise anything, but I'm actually going to write with Bruce Woolley, my writing partner, tonight. And if something happens, comes out of it, I'll let you know, I'll be in touch. So I sort of left feeling a bit flat, you know, thinking I'd so hoped he'd say yes and we'd be off. You know, now we're still, we've got no plans. And um, he phoned the next day and said, he said, we actually had a really interesting night. And we've written this song that we think is quite interesting. We sort of laid down a basic demo. Would you like to come and sing the vocals on it? And I went, yeah, I couldn't wait to hear what it was like. And that was the blueprint for Handheld in Black and White. And what a record. Oh, and, and I heard it and everything, everything started tingling. And I thought, that's it. I mean, you could hear a sound even from the demo. It was just completely different. And that was it. That was it. That was the beginning of this wonderful golden, the golden era. Yeah. So Hand Out Black and White was the first of four songs that you, you worked on with, with Trevor Horn. Mm. Two written with Bruce Woolley, two with a very talented Simon Darlow, mm. who was only about 21, I think, when he wrote one of them. Yeah. Um, so Hand Out Black and White comes out, goes into the charts, makes the top $20 a back, back on top of the pops with your uh, Confederate jacket, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, different image, um, new romantics, all these bands, Spandau Ballet and Duran Duran. I mean, it was an extraordinary time. So much talent, musical talent. Everywhere you looked, there was a different sound, a different image. I mean, it was full throttle, I think, in, back then. Mm. And I think Hand Out Black and White probably influenced the 80s music in general a lot more than it's given credit for. Mm. Because if it wasn't for that record, I don't think Trevor potentially would have had the path that he's had today because that is the record that attracted ABC to want to work on Lexicon of Love, which of course led to Frankie Goes to Hollywood, uh, Pet Simple Shop Minds, Pet Shop Boys, yeah, exactly. Seal. So this whole era of pop opened up off the basis mm. of that one phone call, literally. Because, uh, yeah, and I think it's because Trevor made pop Incredible. It, it became classy to be a pop act. It was always you're a rock act or you're a pop act. And, you know, the rock acts would look down at the pop people and the pop people would go, am I a cool pop act or am I a, you know, a, a really sort of bubblegummy pop act? You know, but he yeah. made pop just like an art form. It became an art form culturally all on its own. And, um, and everybody started to sort of sit up and take notice of, of the production skills. It was gorgeous. Gorgeous, glassy sounds. Mm. So we went from that in the summer, autumn of 81. Mm. And then it's probably the record that most people will remember when they think of the word dollar, the title that comes to mind is Mirror Mirror. 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 Yeah. So talk us about, talk about Mirror Mirror. Oh, I remember when we started working on that. I mean, it was not easy to sing. I mean, it sounds easy and like a very jumpy, poppy. It's actually quite a hard sing. Um, but the melody, it, it's just, it's um, so poppy. I mean, it's like, it is, it's like eating chocolate. It's fantastic. But Anne Dudley, I think it was Anne Dudley, did the um, orchestration of the, of, of, the, 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 of, the, of the keyboard riffs um, that, that, that surround the melodies, the vocal melodies. And brilliant, I mean, classically trained. You know, Simon Darlow, classically trained. So you've got all these musicians with all their insight into how music really fits together from a classical perspective, and Trevor is a brilliant bass player, all making a perfect pop, three and a half minute perfect pop record. But that's the skill set. It's not easy to make something that sounds simple and hooky like that. It's not no, easy at all. It's not. No. 
So what about the video, which I think is probably your, your favourite dollar yeah, video? Yeah, it's certainly in my memory forever. So um, we didn't make a video for Handheld in black and white. And because Mirror Mirror seemed to be doing so well, and it was sort of like scrambling up the charts, even though it was heading towards Christmas, really competitive, uh, but it was doing well. And we thought, we've got a potential hit on our hands. And that was MTV, of course. You know, videos becoming big, 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 part of promoting a, a single. So uh, David Mallet had produced, um, MGM was his um, production company, he produced a couple of videos already for us. So they contacted him and said, you know, they said, we want something really special. And that's when he came up with the idea of us being the dolls in the toy shop, you know, Christmas, snow, and then jumping through the window. Oh my goodness, oh, it was, uh, I mean, he'd said, you know, we're going to have you jumping through a window, I'm going, right. And I think someone said, yes, it's sugar glass. You see people doing it all the time. I went, oh, okay. You know, it's just sugar glass. It's really thin and you just, just give it a shove and it just sort of shatters, you know, and it's fine. I'm going, no problem. Well, when we get there, the, the, sort of the, the shop is, I sort of had thought it was like a shop at really sort of with a little step. Mm. You just sort of push through the window, but this was high, high. off the pavement. So li literally a couple of feet. And um, the sugar glass, someone did mention, it's a bit thicker than they thought it might be. And um, we get to the point where we're going to do the jumping through the window bit. And, I'm, and we practice and we sort of have our arms. So the practice was have your arms like that. And then you, because there wasn't much space, you, you do right foot, left foot, and then bang through the glass. So you haven't got a run. So you go right, left, and punch your arms first, your fists through the glass, and it will just shatter, and then you jump through. Oh, well, um, yeah, but it, it wasn't that easy. So, I mean, I think on the video, you can see how high I jumped. I mean, it was like this. this leap. <laughs> it was a leap. <laughs> but you took off. I actually took off, and I was in heels as well. I don't know what happened. And I landed, and I thought, oh, have we done it? And um, David Mallet came rushing over, he said, are you okay? Okay, that looked great. And then he, and then he looked down and he said, you're bleeding. And I, I sort of got cut you know, from my knee sort of down there. So he said, go into makeup. Lovely, very calm makeup girl. She had this special stuff that you put um, over the cuts and then she put makeup all over it. And I sort of sat down from it. And then David Mallet, as he sort of came, he said, how are you feeling? I said, fine. He said, how do you feel about doing it again? And I went, so he said, have this. And he gave me a, a glass of brandy. I mean, I don't drink spirits. He said, drink that. I gulped about three mouthfuls down. He said, let's go now and do it. And this time they put a, um, a mattress down. Well, you know, did you, the first time you leapt out, was there nothing on the ground no, for you to? No, So he said, it's going to be better this time. You don't have to land or jump. Just punch your way through the, the window, because you put this new window in, and this time you can just fall on the mattress. So don't even think about landing. Just fall, and we'll be there to pick you up. And it's like two or three mattresses, so it's nice and soft. So I'm thinking, well, that's better, because I don't have to jump so high. And um, so, of course, we did that one. But the bright spark that thought that through didn't think that the glass that we punched out had fallen on the mattress before we fell on the mattress. So, of course, I got cut again. But I, I looked at him and he went, that's it. And I thought, that's it. Never, ever, ever doing anything like that again. I was terrified. My heart was bang, bang, bang. I mean, but it looks great. It looks great. I mean, I look at it and I go, I actually did that. That's not a stunt double person. That's me. No, it was a fantastic video. Very hard to top, I think. But it was perfect for the time of year because Mirror Mirror, of course, made the top 10 then at Christmas and carried on up to yeah. number four in, in January 82. And I think it's probably the biggest selling dollar single. Yeah. Uh, Plus, I suppose I also had the slight concern that that red, uh, sorry, that gold lame leather dress was sort of partly glued to me. And I thought, you know, jumping through the window is something going to happen? Is it going to come unstuck? You know, so I had all these, in an awkward place. Exactly. So I had all these things going on in my mind while trying to look just happy. <laughs> so, I mean, it was such a, an iconic moment for Dollar that. And I mean, you were kind of at the pinnacle then, weren't you? Uh, and I imagine that you, you were having a great time and it was, it was just probably one of the best periods of Dollar for you. Oh, I think I was, 
either exhausted or semi-exhausted. Um, we were working really, really hard and uh, I think under so much pressure. So I, I used to look at sort of the videos or Top of the Pops and think, we well, look really sparkly and happy and life is great. I'm thinking, why am I so tired? I used to sit on my sofa at home and either be hiding behind the sofa looking at Top of the Pops and going, is it, was it okay? Does, do I look all right? Did it work well? Or just sitting, you know, in a heap thinking, I'm just so tired. It's making me feel exhausted just watching what we do. Um, so I was pretty tired. That's when I became a vegetarian. Right, okay. Around that Which time. Which you stuck with all this time? Yeah. You're still a vegetarian? Yep. Eat fish, but pescatarian, I suppose, but just couldn't really eat very much. I was so tired. Nothing was digesting properly. It was, we were working hard. And of course, you had to keep the momentum going then, because you fought so hard to, to get back up there. Um, you then followed that up with Give Me Back My Heart. Oh, we did, we did. I think the Paris collection was a great learning curve, actually, in hindsight that once you've got yourselves back and you've found the sound that perhaps you were cr craving for, there is no way we were going to let mess that with go. that. No, that no way we were going to mess with that. So um, recorded Give Me Back My Heart, which is, oh, I love that track. Gorgeous. I mean, again, like a little mini, a mini masterpiece. And uh, favorite moment, the end of Give Me Back My Heart. So it was quite late one night and by then I, I never moved out of the studio. I was sitting next to Trevor Horn the entire time. Whatever he was doing, I never left. He, I didn't leave till he went home because I just, I wanted to learn so every, absorbing it all. everything he thought, did. And sometimes I'd say, well, why are you doing it that way? And he was actually very gentle, you know, very giving. He would say, well, I think it's going to work better or let's try it that way. And he said, I think that one will work better, but we'll do this one first. And then sometimes you can say, well, what do you think? I said, oh, I think I prefer that one. He said, yeah, I do too. So I mean, it was, he was involving me in a sort of collaborative way, which was really, I felt so um, grateful, very honored really. Um, but give me back my heart. So he had this scrap of paper and I think you found the scrap of paper, didn't you? Yes, it was in one of the multi-track boxes when we remixed um, for the new 12 inch. And yeah. uh, he had these lyrics and he went, on the very end here, you know, he said, it's just like going off, like off into the sunset. He said, do you think you could just go and sing something on the very end? And I said, what, just sing the tune? He said, no, make something up. I went, oh, all right then. So um, I went in and he sort of like gave me quite a lot of run in to sort of have a go. And uh, I just started singing this melody to these lyrics and sort of like weaving in and out of the voices already on there and um, so it finished it was like dead quiet and there's this big beam through the window and he said and I went shall I do it again he went come here so I went inside and he played it and he went it's just like Julie Andrews and I said well I can go and do it properly now he said no that's it so it's just like one take just on the spot, it just happened, and I, every time I hear it now, I sort of get goosebumps because it was just sort Brings of like a bit, of, yeah, a bit yeah. of magic, yeah. So Give Out My Heart was a number four hit, so that was two massive hits in yeah. a row. Yeah, And then, well, my favorite one. <laughs> Your favorite, a lot, of people's, a lot of people's favorites, um, yeah. Which, of course, is, is a record that I still don't think anybody has ever topped. It, it, in production, certainly, it's it's just in a league of its own. That's video tech. Video tech. So sensational, huh? Yeah. Just uh, and the, with the great outfit on top of the pops with the old Marks and Sparks ripped men's vest. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yeah. that was desperation. When it strikes, go into Marks and Spencers and just kind of what I'm thinking. What do I wear that's different? You can't wear. I mean, especially for video tech, it's got to be so. I suddenly, I don't even know why I thought about that. Buy a man's string vest, two of them and just cut bits on top of bits, oh, I don't know. and then gluing it to me, it was, a, it, was, it was a bit of a panicky sort of last minute thing, but, but it, it looked all great, worked. yeah, it all I know. Worked. So what do, you, what do you think about Videotech? A lot of people probably want to know how, what that song means to you. Mm. I think it took me actually a little bit of time to really understand it because it's so sophisticated. I mean, on a completely different dimension. Uh, jazz overtones, the subtleties, um, melodically not a powerful 
tune. It's not melodic. That's not what it's about. It's more of this, just this, um, these sounds that come at you, and and and, and very, um, you're very sophisticated. I, I, I loved, it. and of course, all um, the use of the fair light. Um, these sort of like, my my voice had been sort of programmed, and so I sang some notes, and and the note would get recorded, and then saved in the computer, and then you because a note has a certain sort of length, if you play it at a certain pitch, if you play that note lower on a keyboard, like a piano, the note becomes deeper, but it becomes longer and it changes its tone. And if it goes higher, of course, it becomes more sort of, I mean, everyone knows this, but it could become more Mickey Mouse or some yeah. chip monkey, that kind of thing. And so you could have so much fun in messing around with chords and riffs and things. So, I mean, it was sort of, it was, just experimental, really. And it was the last time you worked with Trevor, unfortunately. Mm. Um, he'd gone on to work with ABC, and um, you ended up producing the Dollar Album, which was the most successful Dollar Album, mm. uh, gold record in 1982. And then it all kind of came to an end with, with David, didn't it, in early 1983? Yeah, I mean, I wonder what would have happened if Trevor had finished our album, and we'd had a bit of a break, and then he'd gone on to do another album. I don't know, but I mean, pretty devastated that he didn't have the time to finish the album because I don't know how many more hits would have come from an album. He already had four big, big hits. So I think he thought maybe job well done. And if Lexicon of Love hadn't been such a, a world-class, pivotal album, I probably would have been really upset. But yeah. if he went on to make something like that, then you have to think, wow, you know, we were the very beginning of his career, as you said. So yeah, finished um, the Dollar album. There's some lovely tracks on there. I was pretty happy with that. I was trying to do, again, we didn't want to get another producer in. I mean, how could you follow Trevor Horn? It would be pointless, really. Um, so best to try and just do the rest of the album as best we could. And I think pretty good job for most of it. Yeah, very good. And then that in itself, just all too much. All too much. Again, what do you do? Trevor was so busy. I mean, you know, he was unavailable. Back to the drawing board again. Do you try and be self-sufficient? And I think all of that, David wanted to maybe change direction musically in a direction that I wasn't so sure was the right decision. So we didn't see eye to eye about a few things. And then he just walked out one day. Bye, David. So that was it. Yeah. Bye, Early David. 1983, <laughs> uh, you were on your own. I know. It was, uh, it was actually pretty scary. Pretty scary. I never wanted to be a solo artist. Just, I never crossed my mind back to when we left Guys and Dolls. Not me, I'm the one that likes to work in a team. Uh, but um, no, I had found some good people to support me and uh, I was persuaded, you need to make a solo album. How about we have an English sort of Madonna type person, you're not Madonna, you're not as edgy as she is, but an English pop princess who appeals to the American market. So you went and spent a million pounds making Yeah, not me an personally. Album. I didn't. It wasn't, I would never. That's an obscene <laughs> amount of money to spend on an album. Goodness me. But you ended up working with Arif Mardin, oh, one of I the did. legendary oh. producers of, of all time. What a sweet, Shaka sweet Khan, man. the Bee Gees, Band of, uh, Hollow Notes, Band of Luncheonette. No, Scritty Politi. Oh. Just so, uh, and amazing. The, the big and, kiss. Yeah, big kiss. What an album. I mean, what an album. I was, I don't think, I, I never thought I would ever feel as proud as being involved with the Trevor Horn Dollar Records until The Big Kiss was finished. With all those tracks, with the co-writers, the cream of British writers, that we worked as a team for a year writing this album. Yeah. And Arif, who was just so wonderful. And then the musicians, we had the, the best British musicians we hold ourselves up in a residential studio and we work really hard there to lay the tracks down. And then Arif said, I think we're going to the States now. We'll go to Atlantic, my studio with my engineer. And I'm going, okay. I mean, so there's me, little blonde English yeah. lady, going into a very soul R&B, predominantly black artist studio in the center of New York. And you had all these extraordinary sounds coming out of studios and then you've got this white poppy kind of sound with Arif Marden producing. It was, it was extraordinary. 
It was extraordinary and harsh, sharp and piercing. So Frank Musker was flown up from LA to come and do my backup vocals for the male vocals on yeah. some of the tracks, which was a, uh, we actually had, welcome Frank, welcome back Frank. And we had a banner Did in you? the studio, yeah, right, when he I came in, that. yeah. Okay. Uh, lovely album. So we had two singles off the Big Kiss, the title track, yeah. which had a, an incredibly expensive video. Yes, um, it did. You did Too Much In Love, which you'd written with Terry Britton, mm -hmm. who um, wrote What's Love Got To Do With It for Tina mm -hmm. Turner, which you had wanted to record but got picked yeah, to the post. I did. That was a great song. And you did the theme for the film Gotcha as yes, well. Yes, I did. Yeah, a big US hit. So. But nothing seemed to click, did it? So, so we're at the end of 1985 mm -hmm. now. Uh, and incidentally, the Big Kiss album is on Cherry Pop as well. Two, yes. two discs that's come out this year. Finally. A nice Again, companion to the dollar Cherry material. Pop because a lot of fans only vinyl for 35 years. So amazing? basically, everything is in print at the moment, which is, mm. which is great. But, so you end of 1985, it's getting to Christmas time. What am I going to do? What did you do? Phone David, as one would do when you go, I just. I, I just couldn't imagine doing anything myself ever again. <clears throat> I, I, I just couldn't imagine doing anything as a solo artist. I was completely devastated. And I sort of, I did feel that enough water passed under the bridge to, we had unfinished business. I definitely felt that Dollar's run of success hadn't reached the end. And, um, and I thought, you know, we're a bit more mature now. We've had some time away from each other. He had a solo career as well. And, and he said yes. And we reunited with Chris Neal, which was, um, that was, made it all even better, yeah. We Walked in Love. We Walked in Love, Which Gorgeous was the record. comeback single. Mm. Didn't do quite as well, probably, as everybody would have liked. No. And it took a while, really, to kind of, to kind of hit the stride the second time mm. around. We Walked in Love. Had me say goodbye before, great records, but just didn't quite hit the mark with the public. But then there was a turning point, wasn't there? So, so what happened to change Dollar's fortunes the second time? Yeah, always listening, listening to music, other artists, and um, Erasure. Vince Clark, always been a fan, back to the Yazoo days. Just loved his approach to melody and his sounds and his keyboards. And uh, as you know, Alan, I went and thought I was buying the latest album and I bought the first album by mistake. Yeah. So you thought you were buying the circus for some times. I did. And you ended up buying the debut album and found Ola Moore. I did and I was driving in my car again and I heard it, I thought, oh, that's really good. And I listened to it about 10 times in a row as I often do. And every time it got better and better and I went, found something, I could just hear what it could sound like, you know, the sounds on it. Not that I didn't like their version, but I could imagine our vocals and, and, and just a, a slightly different approach to it. And uh, I thought, have a go. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, have a go. So I put the money up to make that and produce the record and then went to London Records. Wanted a hip record label, something that was not, you know, that something would stand us in good stead and people would be a bit more receptive. And uh, London were very uber cool, very cool record label. And uh, they thought it sounded great. And for once, after a few years of things not quite gelling, everything came together. The video was sensational. We got our image spot on, um, the sounds, the timing, it just all worked. And you were back in the top 10. We were back in the top 10. It was a. Uh, that was a really a great feeling of professional satisfaction. I sort of, I think I had far more my producer hat on then and sort of almost like management hat, yeah. producer hat rather than artist hat. But it, was, it was very satisfying, yeah. Did you ever hear what Vince Clark or Andy Bell thought about it? No, I'm, I'm sure I asked somebody. I think, I, I, well, my, 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 my belief is that um, basically if there had been negative comments, I think they would have surfaced and there was nothing negative, so I'm, I'm hoping that they liked it. I'm sure they were delighted with the check. Yes, I'm sure it was a very, very big hit. Um, and I still love it. I think it still, it still makes me happy. Every time I hear it, I love the synth sound. It's good. So we'd dollar her back, back on top of the pops, yes. back in the top 10. Took a while then to get what would actually turn out to be the final dollar single mm. um, together. 
It's Nature's Way. Um, a great PWR production by Phil Harding and Ian Kerno. Mm. Um, and then it all kind of went away again. Yeah, I think I just, uh, I think it's Nature's Way took much too long to basically, it should have come out straight away, but we were struggling to try and get exactly the right mix. I mean, that was it. Music had accelerated so, so quickly that you needed a formula and, and you know, the Stop Aiken Waterman um, formula, PWL and, and, and all these other producers. It had to be right or you didn't stand a chance. And so you're not going to release a record that you, you feel you're actually going to back yourself. So you, we were struggling to get its nature's way to sound exactly as we wanted it. Uh, we made a very expensive video in Florence because, you know, videos were key to it all. And it, I don't know whether it's timing, just didn't work. Um, I, think, I think personally it was more timing if we'd have brought it out really quickly, quickly off yeah. the back of Olamar, I think it would have been very successful. I think we, it just took too long. And by then, I just thought, that's it, I'm done. I just, too much effort to make a single and, the, and, and to make a video for one single, you know, along with everything else that went with it. It was just not the hard work, it was just too draining. Yeah. So I thought, tick that box, fantastic experience, I need to go off and do something else. So I did. So you just went to the other side of the world? I did. I did, bit radical. Could have gone to Guernsey or Jersey and disappeared for a bit, but no, my sister had emigrated there and I visited once. And I de definitely knew I needed a change for myself. You know, I'd had enough of doing what I was doing. Not enough of music, but just enough of dollar and the merry-go-round and everything that it entailed and the disappointments. I just um, thought I'd had the stuffing knocked out of me and it just didn't make sense anymore. So we've had the benefit of time that's passed since then. Um, lots of years, lots so, of years. And you were, we've been in Australia now for pretty much most of that. Yes, um, I left, I emigrated in 88. Yeah. Mm. So there have been the occasional dollar reunion for various things, Prince's Trust with the Trevor Horn concert, yeah, probably was, being the, the pinnacle. Um, but now, of course, you, you're here promoting these, these new releases, which I are know. a celebration of, of I dollar. I know, I know. How does it make you feel Gorgeous. looking back? Great packaging, beautiful. Um, how does it feel? A bit surreal. It's a bit weird. It's a bit surreal. But then it's also absolutely feels like it's right and it's home and just time doesn't, time's irrelevant really. It doesn't make any difference. And some of the records yeah. that I've sort of had such joy in sort of revisiting, they sound fresh as a daisy. It's uh, quite timeless. extraordinary. Timeless, yes. Yeah, definitely. It's great. You did a very, very, very beautiful job with this. Thank Mr. You. Alan Connor, fabulous. Um, thrilled, I mean thrilled that finally, finally all the dollar of music all in one spot. Yeah. I think that's, that was a dream. That really was a dream to, to, to have all the music together in one box set. And it only took 35 years. Well, you know, who's counting? It's just a number. It's just a number. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But um, yeah, lots of stories and sort of all the backstories and the, the feelings and the emotions um, running through the music. You know, and as I said, um, just chatting to a few of the, the fans at the show last night, just lovely, lovely memories of, of people who remembered getting through a hard time. Like one, one chap told me he, he moved to Scotland when he was 10, from um, Leicestershire, I think. He moved to Scotland when he was 10, and you know, he loved Dollar and loved me and had a picture of me in his bedroom wall. And, it was the thing that got him through being teased at school because of his accent. Really? You know, and that, that's, that means something. You know, just, just however small and insignificant it is, it's not for that person if it made a difference. So um, Having an impact on people. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's really very special. Teresa, it's been lovely to talk to you today. Thank you for sharing all those memories. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's all lovely to talk to you, my darling. And I guess the last thing to say is please uh, go and check out the releases on the Cherry Red website. Oh yes, please do that. They are, there's some fantastic extra tracks there you might not have heard before and some extended versions that are seriously great. Thank you.